today's book, I'm not going to talk much because it's a fascinating uh, one and people who are following it in social media might know more about the book than what I'm going to say. Uh, we are very thankful to Dr. Prabhakar for being here. The book has been published by Speaking Tiger. Speaking Tiger is our associate publisher for Roja Mutaya Library. Our book on T. N. Rajaratnam Pillai was published by Speaking Tiger. Therefore, we are very happy that uh, associate publishers are associated with this event. And uh, before we launch the event, may I request our trustee, uh, Mrs. Ramani Natarajan, to hand over a copy of Journey of Civilization to Dr. Prabhakar, please. May I request funding the DP of Dr. PTR to hand over a copy of uh, a tall man to Mr. Ram. And may I request my colleague uh, Sundar to hand over a copy of TNR's book to Dr. PTR. Before we launch the formal discussion on the book, may I request Dr. PTR to say a few words about DPF and our reading up, please. First, uh, good evening to everybody who's here for this very interesting event. I would just like to retrace uh, the history of our efforts. I think around 2017, the today's Chief Minister, then working president of our party, asked me to uh, create an IT wing for uh, the party. And uh, when I went around trying to recruit people and to frame the uh, the functioning, it became clear to me that the ideology of the movement had lost some of its penetration into the youth. Maybe we were victims of our own success. I would say that in Tamil Nadu, uh, continuous administrations across all uh, parts of the political spectrum have more or less adhered to the principles of social justice, some in a more um, transparent or uh, with more importance and some less so, but there has not been a real deviation going back to the 1921 uh, Justice Party government. In that sense, uh, while other states have progressed in other dimensions because of such continuity in policy, Tamil Nadu stands a bit unique in our progress in social justice. Perhaps as a function of taking that for granted, uh, there was a little bit of disconnect with the history of the movement, uh, the path we had taken to reach this place. So at the advance of the very senior um, party, I would say, luminary, I decided we should do something about getting these values back in circulation and debate in the younger generation, particularly the professionals who had benefited from the reservations and social justice policies who, who were living overseas and working in multinational companies. Some of them were very vocal advocates for the principles and for the movement, but many of whom uh, were not quite aware. So that's how we got this started. I think it was 2018, maybe early 2019. In some ways, it was going a little slower than I would have liked, partly probably because of my own limitations and uh, how many hats I wear. But under the global kind of daily administration of uh, Pohal Gandhi, I don't know if he's here, and Salem Gandhi, 
and through the fortunate connection with the Roja Mitra Library, Kuru Vaspani Salman, uh, the reading uh, hub, we have uh, managed to maintain at least an intellectual uh, excellence, I would say. We have brought speakers from around the world, especially during COVID times. We ran a lot of uh, Zoom calls that were really, really interesting. I tried to dial in as often as I could. And uh, so I'm very grateful that if not quite in scale, at least in the quality and the depth of the intellectual discussions and activities, the DPF continues to have some impact. And I'm particularly grateful to the Rosa Mata Library, uh, the director, and then to the uh, police element, and of course the many people in the um, initiative who keep such events happening. I think today's event uh, will make a, a new high, both because of the quality of the content of this book, and of, uh, of course the intellectual caliber of the author, Dr. Parker. And uh, I'm again thankful to all of you for coming, and I look forward very much to this event. Thank you. We invite Dr. Prabhakar and Mr. Ram to come to the front, please. Crooked Timber of New India, subtitle is Essays on a Republic in Crisis. He's very evocative. Of, of uh, the contents of the, of the book. And uh, I was struck by the clarity of the essays that constitute this book. Most of the major issues that have come to the fore have been dealt with, analyzed with uh, clarity uh, and uh, and an exposition that is extremely accessible. These uh, essays uh, have been pub uh, published in various places. They have been uh, revised in some cases. Some were unpublished. Some of the essays were unpublished. And uh, there's also contributions to this particular book in the form of essays. And these are uh, chapters of the book. First, I can I'll ask. Uh, Dr. Prabhakar, about the title, the metaphor, the crooked timber. Could you give us an insight into uh, the origin of this title? Yeah, you don't need this, I think. Good evening, everybody. Um, let me say this, uh, it's a great honor to be here in the Roja Mutaya Research Center and Library, especially today with uh, Ram. I do not know if Ram knows or not, but to me and uh, a lot of people across the country, Ram is a hero. And to be sitting with you and talking about my little small work is really overwhelming. And uh, as they say, such things don't come alone. Uh, they come and and have, we have a PTF also here. And I'm a great admirer of uh, the way he presents issues and uh, the, the gusto with which he defends um, certain positions. And I'm really honored to be with all of you today. <clears throat> Ram, I have uh, stolen this phrase, the crooked timber, 
from Immanuel Kant, whom I, I, I've been reading him for quite a while. And this particular uh, thing has stayed in my mind for a long time. He says, from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing, could, nothing straight could ever be made. That, that's his usage. I thought that the kind of crooked timber that we see today in New India, nothing straight can ever be made. And I didn't go to the extent, but a friend of mine suggested, would you, would you suggest that it should be hived off? Yes, it should be hived off. Uh, this, there is no alternative to this. You can't really straighten this crooked timber. And when I suggested this to this title to my publisher, my publisher was uh, a little, little concerned in the sense uh, he was uh, doubtful whether this would really um, be, you know, understood by the gender reading public. And they might mistake it for a book on timber trade, you know. But I stuck to my guns. I said, no, it would. Because it, it, it's very plain, it's straight. And uh, when they see crooked timber and new India, they would automatically, people connect to this. I must say, Ram, at this stage, uh, as uh, you know, when you, when you see a movie, when you read a novel, uh, the writer invariably tells us that, look, the characters are fictitious. Any resemblance to, yes. you know, the, the real life characters are it's it's only coincident. Now, when I said the crooked timber of New India, people, some people got agitated. But it's coincidental. I did not mean it that way. But if, if somebody wants to really own up the crookedness and try to become defensive about it, I can't really help. The story about the what your publisher said reminds me of uh, what the writer R.K. Narayan once told us about the title of his novel, The Financial Expert. He said uh, a sort of uh, glorified money lender who had never read a book in his life bought a hundred copies and sent it. He had a firm and sent each copy to various people in his firm. Uh, because he had become quite big by that time and then realized that uh, it, there was no expertise was involved. But uh, <laughs> whether, Narayan, whether it really happened or Narayan made it up, because he's that kind of writer, I can't say. But it reminded me of that. But coming to the uh, organization of this book, uh, I said that uh, it has great clarity. So my, the first, my first thought was, why was it why was it not written in terms of just chapters rather than a collection of essays? Uh, because it lends itself uh, beautifully to that organization. You dealt with uh, various key issues that have come to the fore. They are capable of being uh, organized into this. But I guess the answer was there is a certain integrity and a certain voice that uh, that belongs to the period in which you wrote these, uh, namely between. Early 2020 and late 2022, right? So each it stands out. That's that, that's the answer, and uh, uh, many were adopted for your from your or written for your video blog, Midweek Matters. Prabhakar is uh, a well-known public intellectual, apart from being a, a scholar, an academic. Because he, he takes his ideas across on different uh, platforms. Uh, the common theme, the running theme here, running through these essays, as you say in the introduction, is that India's inexorable drift towards becoming a republic with highly compromised secular, liberal, plural, democratic credentials. Highly compromised. How, how compromised are we? At what stage of uh, compromise or erosion 
of uh, these credentials. I'll give you uh, a real life uh, situation. You know, when I when I contacted some publishers um, and told them that I have a, a book to be published, they were very enthusiastic. Then, as any publisher would ask you to send you uh, a few samples of your uh, work. So, I did. And then, Ram, nobody would uh, call me back. They wouldn't answer my emails. They don't take my calls. And after a long time, the one of the one or two of them get back to me and say, So we have a a long queue waiting list. Many things are in the pipeline because of the pandemic. Are you in a hurry to publish it? Can you wait? I said, I'm not in a hurry to publish it. I can wait. Then they said, can you wait until 2024? I don't know why you laughed. I said, I'm not in a hurry, but then I can't wait until 2024. Then I said, uh, you know, I, I was a little, uh, I wanted to be a bit more compromising and said, would you, would you, are you telling me that you're going to publish it in 2024? And they said, no, we are not committing now, but we will consider in 2024. Then I got the point. I said, no, I can't wait till then. So, this tells us to what extent our diverse, liberal, secular, um, democratic credentials are compromised. This is my real life situation. Um, you see, um, Somebody asked me some time ago, um, you published this book and you're safe. Yes, the day before I was in Ahmedabad. Uh, I just told uh, PTR and uh, Ram about my experience there. We have to keep in mind one important point, that is, democracy is not you know finished off in one fell swoop these days. That was in seventies, sixties, seventies. You know uh, the coup and you know uh, army and army officers used to move into the presidential palace, arrest the uh, you know incumbent president or the prime minister, capture the radio station, television station, and then announce the martial law. It's not that anymore. It is. A slow, inexorable, probably even unnoticed kind of a muzzling of the freedoms. Gradually, slowly, you won't even realize. That is the situation we are in. And I'm very worried about it. That is the reason why I have been writing. Since you are here, I must tell you one more thing. You know, in 2019, I wrote a piece on the state of the economy. I was a bit critical because I was concerned. I was not critical of anybody, but I said, look, you know, look at the, look at the uh, uh, credit offtake, look at the rural distress, look at the, you know, falling growth rate, look at the unemployment, look at the inflation, price, etc., etc. And then I sent it to a very prominent newspaper. It's supposed to be a very courageous newspaper. I don't want to name that newspaper. But they sat on it. In 2019, they won't publish it, but they won't tell me that they're not, they're not going to publish it. So I waited and waited and waited and waited. For almost three weeks, I waited. And then understood that they were not going to publish it for whatever reason. So I sent it to the Hindu. And it was published. So, what 
I am concerned about the the the, the compromise nature of you know our democracy or liberalism or pluralism etc has been there and everything that i wrote in this book was informed by these experiences it's not as free as we all would like to think it is it is not as free as we are told that it is you know it's no more in uh, characterizing this process which started a long time ago but gained momentum in the 1990s uh, you, you have written on this uh, with great uh, clarity the different stages uh, when do you think did the process become irreversible we are talking here about uh, the, the process um, which gained uh, momentum what you call irreversible momentum since the bjp led by narendra modi and amit shah came to power in 2014 but much of the groundwork had been laid in the uh, 1990s and perhaps starting even in the late 80s with the ram janmabhoomi uh, agitation uh, the uh, propaganda about conversions the threat to the hindu samaj from within and to some extent even the question of uh, court infiltration uh, from mainly from bangladesh uh, of what they meant uh, they, in assam it was any any bengali muslim or hindu but uh, to the bjp and company it was uh, muslims who came from there so are we is there a danger of underestimating the uh, the toxicity of what happened under a liberal facade namely the vajpayee government where uh, the real principal ideologue was uh, mr lal krishna Kish, uh, adwani are we overestimating the the strength and power or the present dispensation because as you say it's a very gradual process and we need to understand this transformation you can say this is the second coming of hindutva perhaps but the first but the coming of hindutva on center stage was has it been properly understood this is a very troubling question i tried to think about this applied my mind to this um, let's see what used to be the discourse can see, you hear no i I'll, i'll use this how is it now no no bad no bad can you hear somebody will update me well so yeah you don't want one is not clear now i think it's too much <laughs> uh ram what uh stands out to me the kind of transformation in the political conversation that used to happen that's happening today now how it transformed bjp for a long time most of you would remember used to time and time again say that we are also a secular party we are also secular but not like them not we are we are not an appeasing secular we are genuine secular we are genuinely secular and today what is the political discourse i am also hindu but not like them now look at the transformation how did this happen today 
there are political leaders who would say we are also hindu i go to temples i fast for 9 days on such and such occasions but i am not politicizing my hindutva my my hinduness i am a hindu not like them from i am secular but not like them to i am hindu but not like them that is the major transformation that has occurred in the indian political discourse which came about you know it took decades if you want me to put a date i probably will not be accurate but i can tell you what my sense is you know actually for for this kind of an ideology to flourish the most fertile ground was immediately after partition you know thousands of dead bodies from the other side of the border into india and another some thousands of dead bodies on the train to you know to pakistan and thousands of people in the refugee camps in and around delhi you know look, these leaders are nobody is actually compared to the kind of leaders you had in the in the late 40s and 50s and even 60s shyam prasad mukherjee guru golwalkar Um, Balraj Mathok, Swami Karapatri Ji, people like that. But these forces could not raise their heads. That's a puzzle, you say. That's a puzzle. You know, to a large extent, to some extent, significant extent, Gandhi Ji's murder also would have contributed. All right, but but you know that 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 that's not that wasn't enough for me. But you know, after that, somehow. the mainstream political platforms in the country have become complacent they become election fighting machines who are active during the elections and completely inactive on the ideological front between elections they have nothing to do from one election to the other they're just sleep walking from one election to the other in between there is absolutely no uh, and everybody started doing business with and you know i remember very well for a long time you mentioned lal krishna advani he used to say we are not untouchables there there should not be any political untouchability we are also elected like you are elected so don't treat us as untouchables but if you if you look look at it over the last 3 4 decades every political platform in this country except one or two have done business with them have been they in their support participated either from inside or from outside the government they were part of the cabinets so it was normalized people like you know the liberal face or liberal uh, projection of atul bihari vajpayee that probably would have helped but then people have missed even 2014 if you recall the main plank of the bjp and its prime minister candidate then was fight against corruption fighting against corruption against policy paralysis development and i remember very well the prime minister candidate in his election hearing he used to time and time again say the fight is not between hindus and muslims hindus but the fight is between hindus on the and the muslims on the one side and poverty and unemployment on the other side that's the fight so the you know they they smuggled themselves into the government into the you know power using not what they are implementing today but something else development corruption etc etc and then once you know the purpose is served all these little little things were you know thrown out as i mentioned the actual payload is hindutva you know all these other things are you know they they were jettisoned you know as as it is going up 
each one uh, corruption is gone unemployment is gone you know creation of employment is gone everything else is gone but something else what ex- what they had in mind stays that is put into the orbit today in the indian political uh, situation you uh, make it very clear that the modi shah bjp has works with two advantages and i quote one a knock need opposition to the coming to fruition of dec- decade long grunt work put in by the hindu supremacist rss and its many parivar organizations which have never really accepted our constitution and you go on to say that the second became possible and went on unchallenged largely because the political forces that are wedded to the founding values of our republic had not sized up that's very important had not sized up the menace posed to those values by the long years of electorally unrewarding quiet and arduous work that had been put in by the sang parivar outfits away from the limelight of news cycles i think this is a very important formulation in this book a very important uh, presentation of a set of ideas uh, in this could you elaborate on this point because without uh, understanding the the evidence and the logic behind this it will be very hard to get a sense of uh, what this book or this collection of essays are all about as i said um there is a gradual transformation that has occurred in the nature of indian political discourse how did this come about as i said you know the most fertile ground was in 47 48 49 that was over and then still the work to turn indian mind into a communal mind or what they used to call hindus who are divided along caste lines should be united as hindus that has become possible not just because of you know the present prime minister or present uh, home minister or whatever they they are they are just enjoying the fruits of decades long work and here we as a matter of fact we must recognize the hard work that is put in for decades by faceless uh, numerous faceless people who were willing to put in that kind of a work who were motivated to put in that kind of a work without expecting electoral rewards without expecting any you know uh rewards in terms of positions or you know power pal fed nothing they just went on working and working and and today's bjp is the beneficiary of those decades of you know long work hard work work that was put in so much so that in 89 rajiv gandhi had to launch his electoral campaign from ayodhya from ayodhya he had to launch his campaign and today you know what is the kind of there, there is there is somebody today who could who could rant against mahatma gandhi without being challenged it's 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 not it's not uh, you know it's it's not difficult 
to say that this land is Hindu land. It is it's for Hindus. It is not for everybody. It, it, it can be said today unchallenged without, without really you know, uh, thinking twice about this. It is possible. Even 10, 15, 20 years ago, so it was not possible. Whatever you had in mind, there are some people who have in mind, who have had in mind, you know, for, for the last so many decades. But they did not have the intellectual courage or the political courage to come out openly and state these positions. Today you are able to state these positions and also draw applause, draw appreciation. That is possible today. And all this, because uh, Ram, you know very well, as much as uh, you know anybody else, is that politics is not in their vacuum. It, after all, is a culmination and you know a, a fruition of social, economic, cultural, and other factors. You know, if you remove these things, you can't talk about uh, uh, a, a, a political reality. Political reality is informed by these things. Today, instead of our constitutional values of diversity, liberalism, secularism, etc., some other set of values are informing our polity. And that is because of the you know decades of arduous grunt work that was put in by hundreds and hundreds of cadre uh, of the RSS. But there are also state-based parties, for example, the DMK and even the AI DMK, where put in a lot of hard work, grunt work at the organization level. Take the DMK, for example. It was out of power for several years, for 2011. But uh, the work continued and the present, our chief minister, M.K. Stalin, I think, was very much in charge of uh, the uh, organizational work. They kept it alive. and. The same thing you can say for the AIDMK to some extent, that even after the passing of two tall leaders, M.G. Ramachandran and Jayalalitha, they continue to be a force. And there are similar parties uh, elsewhere, so, which are often called regional parties. So to some extent, they are a counterweight to, to the otherwise unstoppable Safran Brigade the Hindutva forces or Hindu supremacist forces that are going on, are they not, uh, is it not a very positive factor that they have kept, because not all of, I think you can't say about all of them that uh, they function only from election to election. Uh, so far as the Congress is concerned, I think that's true, particularly in this state where they, you know, hardly any organization work. So do you see this as a mitigating factor on, on the side of the opposition? Forgive me, I have a, a, a mixed feeling about this. Um, to a large extent, what you said is right. Some of these uh, political and, parties and BTRs, are… And this uh, forum is uh, yeah. very much uh, a response to that situation at, uh, at the ideas level and values level. Yeah. Yeah. So. I would completely agree with you, provided they have not done business with BJ. Hmm? They have not done business with BJP. They've gone. No, if they had not done. Yeah, the, your Faustian bargain. Yes. Is if they had not, uh, if, 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 if they had said, okay, you, you, th there's no room for you in Tamil Nadu. There is no room for you in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh. There is no room for you in, say, uh, Telangana. Maybe there is no room for you, etc., etc., some places. But I win it. I win this. And give it to you. There is a problem there. If they had said, I won't let you enter here, I oppose you to tooth and nail, I will win this, but I will halt you. I don't want to do business with you. If they had said this, yes, I would 100% agree with you. That's the reason why I said I have a mixed feeling about this. They are clear. But probably, probably 
most of these I'm, i'm not trying to say look i'm very wiser than you know all these big political leaders and you know it's after all you know practical politics they yes. have to you know they have to make compromises and somebody had said politics is an art of making compromises and things like that yeah all these are fine but the the, the point is this the point is what i term as the faustian bargain where you are prepared to sell your soul to the devil in exchange for some kind of a, a little little uh, you know advantages and you analyze the motives why they do it yes. can you share that with us yes uh, for instance look at the political parties the political parties who would not allow this juggernaut to roll into these states they would tomorrow strike a bargain with them and say that this is in the interest of the state you know um, because we need to be friendly with the uh, union government to get grants to get railways and you know to get investments and and things like that i'm not trying to say they're wrong but this is what has happened now today in some places where they know that they can't enter despite whatever efforts at the end of the day they are they are okay with it because ultimately whoever wins here you know would lend their support to us wouldn't they and it has happened and it could happen therefore ram in this whole narrative and this whole thing that's happening in india i don't really put much in store in the wisdom of the political parties alone the political parties if if the public opinion if the civil society is very clear about these things tell me which political party would dare to do business with these kind of forces they wouldn't yes but that has compromised also now civil for instance look at uh, karnataka elections in fact my book was first first conversation on the book happened in bangalore one day after the karnataka elections were uh, declared you know results came out after the results came out results were declared and everybody was upbeat everybody was happy and i said maybe Uh, not to the liking of many people is that you know let's not prematurely celebrate those things because after all the bjp's it was not bjp's government the mandate was not bjp's they have taken it over after a year or so now they have gone back to where they were in in 2018 they sat they are, they are now sitting in the position as they sat in the position in 2018 but what concerned me and what concerns me today is this that their 2018 vote share of 36% has not shrunk and their hold more or less on the coastal karnataka remained intact they ruled on the bangalore and surrounding areas more or less holds so what are we celebrating so the point that i was trying to make there was you know one election even if it is 2024 if the present dispensation is defeated i would still think that at least another decade or decade and a half hard work among the civil society is important to see that this poison that is now in the country which is injected is completely excised from the minds of the people and you know it's gone very deep ram i can tell you um, at least one anecdote in this during during our conversation sometime but i can tell you the the the, the poison is so deep yes uh, here you dig quite deep and i was fascinated to read your critical analysis of the chap uh, pure research the the research they did on india the survey you criticized the methodology but uh, 
it is of some significance. The findings, uh, for example, uh, the number of the proportion of people who say that uh, you you know being a Hindu, uh, you being a Hindu is uh, you have to be a Hindu to be a real Hindu, at least in a civilizational sense, I guess, to be a, a, a real Indian. And you have to do, speak uh, Hindi in order to be a real Indian. So there's some there's fertile soil, presumably. And then I also was uh, interested in your discussion of the of that uh, drawing in the German humorous magazine, the rabbit and the duck. Uh, so uh, which is quite fascinating. In fact, uh, that could be a whole book in itself. If you expanded the ideas, could you share your uh, your your thinking on that? That's why you say it's the, it's gone very deep, yes. and yet there are some bright areas. Rama, can you imagine that with this kind of a price rise, with this kind of inflation? And with this kind of uh, unemployment, especially youth unemployment, you know, youth unemployment, I do not know how many of you are familiar with the data. I don't want to, you know. I think that's very important. A lot that. of uh, data. On, uh, I want to, you know, make this evening as uh, prosaic as possible, not too much. But the book is solidly it's backed by data, or, or what is used. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, our youth unemployment is 23%. PTR is here. Can you hear? You're able to hear? No? You have to speak up, I think. How is this now? Okay. Yeah. The youth unemployment today is 23%. Roughly 28.9, I mean 22.9, no, 23, roughly 23. Data source? Data from source? Data source. I, I'm, this is really important. Yeah. Data source. Government of India has no data. It has, the Prime Minister has some data. The Prime Minister knows how many times he was abused. Precisely. <laughs> uh, but it, not 90 times, not 85 times, not 92 times, 91 times. Precise data the Prime Minister has on how many times he was abused. But if you ask the government how many migrant labor died, how many uh, COVID deaths happened in India, you know, what is the state of uh, affairs in terms of oxygen supply, uh, what is unemployment, what is the, uh, uh, the labor partic participation ratio, labor force participation ratio, um, they don't have data. And, and I'm not seeing this just like that because I, I didn't find it. The government ministers say this in the Houses of Parliament. That they don't have data. So you have to now necessarily go to, um, you know, sources like the Centre for Monitoring Indian Economy, CMIE, or, you know, the other sources that, uh, that we have. Or sometimes, you know, normally the, the, the international organizations put out data which are collected from the governments, respective governments, because they, they don't themselves go out into the field and collect the data. So whatever the government of India gives them, they, uh, you know, they, they, they formulate their conclusions, their observations on the basis of that, and they give it. But sometimes we also have, especially when it comes to growth rate, unemployment, poverty, and all that kind of a thing, they sometimes do their independent studies. One such independent study by the you know IMF, World Bank, etc., they give you uh, youth unemployment. Youth unemployment, we are in the company of Ram, you'll be surprised. We, we are in the company of Lebanon, Syria, Iran. 
we are in company of illustrious company of these people these countries bangladesh has 12% youth unemployment half of what we have slightly slight around half of what we have you know all the demographic dividend the so called demographic dividend is squandered i don't know how many of you remember but we had very catchy programs with catchy names stand up india made in make in india skill india hello india doubling the farm farm income and all that you know i because i don't have much to do i go into the ministry's websites and their uh, annual reports and in the government this government even if it is a small achievement they are very good at amplifying it and and trying to you know uh, get a lot of we uh, are mileage out of it now today i tell you please go home and have a look at you know about skill development about uh, doubling of farm farm income about khelo india about make in india not a single word in those respective ministries annual reports also they don't talk about it they are meant for you know one or two days of headlines headline management after that the 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 all the programs the the catchy uh, phrases etc they fall on the basis they are not bothered nobody is bothered about them so demographic dividend is is squandered there is a massive youth unemployment and there is a massive skill gap you i'm not talking about the skills of those people who are not employed even those who are employed that's the reason why i say ram if you notice i say india's unemployed and the india's Un unemployable unemployable because you see our skilling of our workforce is 5% you just start compare with uh, you know uh, japan or south korea who are somewhere around uh, 85% even among our peers among, in, among the in labor force yes yeah it's it's it, 5% is what it's miserable we don't train our people and if we make in india we have to consume it nobody else would would bother to you know lift it that's that's the problem uh, it, it gives a pain that that such a huge resource and the very smart people intelligent people just give them a skill you're not giving them a skill instead you're giving them a trishul in their hand that's what they do you know uh, we are what what we are trying to you know make the militants of for a wrong cause for a division cause you know for othering you know this kind of a thing is happening and i don't have to you know uh, uh, repeat this in front of this kind of uh, uh, audience who are very well informed that you know the debt is you know in the last 7 to 8 years it's more than 100 lakh crores and look at the look at the kind of uh, um, uh, private investment which used to be 30% now it's about 7 to 18% pdr it's, it's somewhere around that 8 19% maximum 19% even if you want to be generous it's not more than 19% this is despite all the captains of industry openly publicly praising the government you know but if you ask them to invest they are not willing to invest now i think i think uh, dr jayshankar told the parliament or somewhere uh, last couple of days that so far so far this year 80000 people have relinquished india's indian citizenship 80000 so far and this has been happening every year especially since 2014 year after year not less than a lakh and a lakh and a half every year high net worth individuals are leaving the country 
they don't want to invest here. Why? They said the government is very good. Why can't they invest? And this is in spite of the government leaders repeatedly pleading with the private sector, please invest. They are not in, willing to invest. And this is the this is the kind of sta state we have. And and uh, look at the look at the look at the inequalities. In 2014, Ram, there were 125 billionaires. Today, there are 145 billionaires. Are you not proud of it? <laughs> Why are you laughing? From 125 billionaires, we, we are now 145 billionaires. We should be happy. Aren't we growing? But you are not happy. The reason why you are not happy is you look at the 85% of the population which is pushed into poverty. And a couple of days ago or last week, I think there, were, there was a, a, a flood of reports in all the newspapers that 415 million people have got out of the poverty. I'll come to that. I think I mean, that needs about 10 minutes of my time, of your time. I'll, I'll I'll explain that to you, but you know this is the, this is the kind of uh, the economy we are living in, and then of course we have these lynchings, we have these uh, dog business, we have these um, economic boycott calls, we have calls um, for uh, genocide, you know. Yes, all these kind of things are, are on, now, on on skilling. Mr. Modi, as Chief Minister, used to often speak about it. He's told me and others, he wouldn't give press conferences, but in interactions that uh, we are lagging behind countries like China in this. We have only about 500 odd skills. They have 10 times the number of skills. So it is not that he didn't uh, realize the importance of it. But uh, now, uh, the story uh, is in your book. On economic issues, you call the present government, the Modi government, staggering, I quote, staggeringly incompetent. You want to say something about that? I said staggeringly incompetent. Yeah. Um, at that time, when I said that, when I wrote that, I couldn't think of a stronger word. <laughs> it's worse than that. As I as I gave demonetization. You, can you believe that? Can you believe that? You know, even a Vodou economist will not tell you to go for demonetization. And 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 you know. Um, the, the, the so-called economic gurus of this government. They said it's a it's a strike against the black money. Ram, have you have you seen anybody holding black money in currency? Unless he has just taken you know the bribe yesterday or day before. <laughs> You don't find, and then what happened? What happened after months? 98.3% 98 of the currency has come back. 99.3, sorry, I'm not 98. 99.3% of the, of the demonetized money has come back to the, to the banking system, and then the fresh notes were taken. What's the point? But then what did you undergo? The, the informal sector has completely collapsed. It was slaughtered. It didn't, even now it didn't get up. That is the kind of economic philosophy. That is the kind of economic uh, wisdom that this government has displayed. And that is the reason why I said this is a staggeringly incompetent uh, in managing the economy. Not only in managing the economy, but in every other sphere of our public life, except 
one thing they are very good you know we we talk about the animal spirits in the economy the this government is very good at summoning the animal spirits in the polity in the polity in the polity not in the economy in the polity and you can see it um, you can see it in manipur you had seen a little little of it in in different places but i'm sorry to say this but northeast is somehow not so much emotionally integrated with the mainland we don't feel very much for what is happening in manipur and we don't bother to you know our our mainstream media also doesn't pay much attention and give much space and much time to to this imagine if something like that similar to that happens in 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 mainland india imagine and i can tell you this that if we are indifferent to these kind of trends that are happening today that we see a day is not far away when such things are going to happen in our midst in 2003 it happened i i i'm just fresh back from ahmedabad i can tell you there are at least uh, three other important uh, subjects being analyzed in this book there is a fascinating log book on uh, our pandemic experience uh, what it meant for india and i think that there could be a separate book expanded because i think it's very important uh, then there is the whole uh, the attack on free speech freedom of expression other democratic rights also a chapter uh, also a special a special reference to uh, the control of uh, the internet the attack on digital freedoms uh, partly through the uh, it it act intermediate strategic technologies etc act 19 i mean 2021 and subsequent amendments um, but before that uh, why don't you take your 10 minutes on inequalities which is a very important part of uh, the book what the poverty data i don't know most of you must have seen um uh the the recent report that 415 million people um uh, who are you know taken out of poverty you've seen that if you look at that carefully ran almost all the newspapers almost all of them printed more or less exactly the same version because it's a pti dispatch they have not even most of them have not even bothered to edit it also so therefore if you read in one newspaper all the other newspapers are identical number 1 number 2 this is a a undp study supposed to be a undp study on multi dimensional poverty index which is very important we have to understand the background of this multi dimensional poverty index why did this come about this has come about because in many countries in many societies somebody is earning 100 rupees today and tomorrow they would earn 150 rupees or 200 rupees let's say and 
which means that you know that that segment of population or those families or that individual has increased its in, their income and then if it is slightly above the kind of poverty uh, line then you say they are lifted out of poverty but what if they can't afford schooling what if they can't afford health care what if there is no transport to go around what if they can't consume news what if they cannot access television what if they can't go for a cinema what if they can't uh, have uh, access to a clean drinking water what if they can't uh, have uh, what if they don't have uh, sanitation facilities etc et so there was a, a, a very uh, a strong uh, advocacy that income poverty itself or income itself is not sufficient along with income you need to have all these in order that is why it is called multi dimensional poverty index you need to have these also along with income then it's meaningful then you are really out of poverty just by you know pushing uh, 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 10000 rupees into my pocket it, it doesn't make me non poor but there are people creative people who can take advantage of this and we have taken advantage of this and we we means government of india what the formulation was income is alone not the indicator of poverty but all these multi dimensional things you have to take into account what the the recent uh, report this is a little slate of hand here it doesn't talk about income if you notice carefully it talks about road infrastructure it talks about sanitation it talks about electricity connection etc say and then say between this year and this year there's a huge amount of progress Therefore, four hundred fifteen uh, million people have come out of poverty. Instead of saying, in addition to income, that is the spirit of the entire multi-dimensional uh, poverty index. But we have taken that out because I see no way in which income of this section of people has increased. because between 2019 and today pre pandemic we have not you know after pandemic the the, the kind of pummeling the kind of drubbing that the indian economy has received is 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 staggering we have not gone back to pre pandemic level yet when that is the case i don't have to give a lot of details but just you know broadly when we have not gone back to 2019 how is it possible that we were able to lift 415 million people out of poverty one question another one related to this allow me to say this we are told that we have overtaken the uk economy <laughs> you know there were our colonial masters they ruled from st fort st george you know all these places and now we are a bigger economy than the united kingdom isn't it yeah. matter of pride it is if at all if it really happened if it actually happened but the point is this now when in 2019 you have not even got back to 2019 level how could you have overtaken somebody is it possible i am not I, i i just want this house to understand is it because we have grown or somebody else has shrunk i do not know please please try and get it 
try and understand try and find out what exactly has happened how did we become the peter should tell us isn't it how did we become uh, the fifth largest when we have not gone back to 2019 the uh, we we have how much time do we have huh let's say 15 to 20 if you it's all right uh, then we will do justice i won't go into uh, all the areas dealt with uh, on uh, the digital economy and what they are doing to it or uh, the pandemic except to point out in the case of the pandemic that uh, you know the chapter has to be read it's fascinating because it's like a diary it's diaristic it's like a journal uh, about uh, again one would say can we say staggeringly incompetent uh, for example the the mortality numbers i think of, i don't know the latest or what they have released officially is it 600000 people died uh, of uh, covid related causes of course that's arguable how how do you define a covid death or covid related death but uh, i wish to point out that in independent assessments one done by the new york times another by the economist the ballpark figure was something like 5 million people uh, so that, that's uh, that's an area i think that has to be read but but the question i will select for uh, a few minutes before we we have a little you know if if you wish to raise relevant questions i i realize that many of you wouldn't have read the book or even skimmed it but it's worth reading and if we cover all aspects there'll be less incentive to read the book which i think is strongly recommended but i i will select one one question and then uh, maybe we can have 10 to 12 minutes uh, others can ask questions or make comments if they like and this i think is very important when you are thinking and another concern that runs through these essays this is on page 14 in the introduction and i quote the crisis that the indian republic faces will not disappear with the electoral defeat of the modi shah bjp because that entity however overpowering it might seem today is not the fount of the crisis i think that's a, an important formulation the crisis is deeper and the challenge to the republic is much more formidable than what the modi shah led bjp per se poses today's knock need opposition could be straightened and made to stand its ground and get its act together want to elaborate on that uh, concern i do not want to sound pessimistic i have a lot of reasons to be optimistic too let's see um it is a knock need opposition i said because it's just not able to stand erect stand the ground okay there are, there are efforts uh, very heartening to see there are some efforts uh, but you know these opposition platforms have allowed a free run to the present juggernaut to grow and uh, amass huge resources financial resources and power manpower and all that it it, it happened because all the others were you know very complacent they didn't as i said they didn't size up the the challenge but you see the the 
it rests power rests on just about 38% of the popular vote because how our republic is configured this had given a huge number of seats dominant position in the in the in the in the legis central legislature that's a different thing but 62% or 63% of the popular vote is outside this spell Therefore, there is there is a hope. One. The second point I would like to make in this connection is that the the challenge is not as insurmountable as it seems. this dispensation is defeatable and you know in 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 different parts of the country we have seen this only when it comes to you know the the the, the central legislature you need to um, configure it in a different way the response to the challenge has to be configured in a, in a different way and and probably the the wise men in the wise men and women in the in the opposition uh, conclaves etc they might they might arrive at something you know, eventually let us let us see um the fight if it is not unequal and the kind of superiority that which is apparent today is neutralized in the form of making people understand what is the danger to the republic to the idea of india is not very difficult you know uh, but if it is if it is a question of who has to lead and who is the who is the uh, main main uh, main force and who has to become the prime minister and if, if these are the things that bog down the already knock need opposition then of course we have a, a huge problem and india uh, it, it's a it's a little step forward for india to come together i n d i a the alliance let us hope so let us hope so, yeah. let us hope so. let us hope so i do not know exactly you know um i i i do not know as much as you do you know how how this would pan out no, nobody knows yeah uh, but but let's hope so in terms of values that's important i mean and and you know one important thing is that first of all whether they come together or not either together or separately one resolve has to be made that nobody does business with his yes persons with this the business because the bargain that, that's very important even then in that case even if opposition unity doesn't take place also there is a ray of hope if nobody does business with them then there is there is a huge hope isn't it but if they are not very strong in that resolve then anything can happen that that is the danger um that's so, so yeah and uh, thank, thank you, you for uh, to yes. sundar ganeshan and paneer selvam for uh, presenting this on behalf of our guest as well as everyone here we, we really appreciate the work of the roja motaya research library and if you had more time i think you could have shown him around uh, your uh, resources thank you